A very pleasant good morning to each one who is tuning this morning to another Sunday School session. Coming to you from the Church of God Universal at 83 Walker's Road. I am your host, Brother Isaac Eady, and it's my pleasure to bring to you again this morning another lovely Sunday School lesson as we study about justification. We are studying in this quarter on the subject of justification. And this morning, our lesson is entitled, Knowing We Are Justified. Knowing We Are Justified. That's the title of our lesson this morning, or the subject for our lesson this morning. And I trust that we will be uh, clear in understanding that we can know that we are justified. Thank you for tuning in. And I wish for you a very blessed and happy Sunday morning as we again study God's wonderful word. Let's have a word of prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again this morning because you are such a wonderful, faithful, loving, forgiving, and awesome God. It is indeed in you we live, move, and have our being. And we exalt you this morning, dear Lord, because we know that there is no other God but you. You have redeemed us from our sins. And we have the assurance this morning, dear Lord, that we are safe. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will help us, that we will anchor our, our faith in you this morning, dear Lord, and not allow Satan in any way or any of his angels to interrupt our peace and our joy in following you, in knowing you, in, in being a child of, your, of yours, dear Lord. Bless us this day, dear Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Bless me now, dear Lord, as I do my part to help to impart your word, dear Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit will take control of me, of my thoughts, my mind, my words, and everything pertaining to this lesson, dear Lord, that it will be clear and understood. Bless the listening audience. We pray that you will bless each one. Thank you for the support of each one from Sunday to Sunday as they engage in these studies. Bless us now as we continue to look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Knowing we are justified. The aim of the lesson is to show that a Christian can and should know that he is saved. To show that a Christian can and he or she should know that he is saved or you are saved or justified. That's another word we use um, to convey salvation and justification and salvation, knowing that you are saved. And we have a lovely verse of scripture for our memory verse found in Romans 8 and 16. And it reads, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit itself, which is God's Spirit, bear witness with our spirit, our redemptive spirit, that we are the children of God. So when we make ourselves available to God for his cleansing and we allow God to take our sins from us and cleanse us by his blood, his spirit witness with us that that process has happened. And we feel and we know when that burden has been moved from our hearts, our mind, 
our being becomes a different reality. And we know that. And we experience that. And that's the assurance that God has saved us from the heavy burden of sin that we carried when he let his spirit come in and witness to us that our sins are forgiven. So the memory verse again says, the spirit itself bear it witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Our introduction, one of the common lies that the devil has imposed upon religious minded people is that no one can know that he is saved or justified until he reaches heaven. Let's pause there. I think it is very important for us to know that we are saved here before we depart this life. Because if we are going to wait until we arrive to the destination, then we might not be <laughs> in the right destination that we hope to be, okay? But it's good to know that our documents for our journey to that destination is in order. We are going to go to Israel, as it were. We need to know that we have the proper documentation, visas and the right ticket, taking the right airline, and all the requirements that is um, laid out for us arriving there and to be received and have the freedom of entering is in order. Right? That's how we do things here on earth to sojourn our daily lives and our, our move from movement from one place to the other. So if it is that important that we need to know all of these things and have all these things in place, why should be why should we be so casual about our eternity des, our eternal destination? We should give that great thought and, care and carefulness to know that we are prepared and have everything in place before we take that departure. So we shouldn't wait until we get to heaven to know that we were destined for heaven. Okay? So it says here, one of the common lies that the devil has imposed upon religious-minded people is that no one can know that he is saved or justified until he reaches heaven. No, we can know for sure that we are saved. How can anyone be happy in his Christian experience and be joyful in Christ if he is haunted by the thought that he is not sure he is justified and does not know if the approval of God is upon him. When God approves of us, he allows his spirit to witness with us and in us and through us the evidence of his work in us. Okay, so be aware of that. This lesson will bring to light the fact that we can know that we are saved. It is important to know that we are saved. Anyone who does not know for sure that he has passed from death unto life is certain to have a weaker testimony than the one who has the confidence of being delivered from sin and has asserted his liberty in Jesus Christ. So, when Christ comes into our lives, when we contritely, genuinely, ask God's forgiveness, confess to him, and mean it from the heart, not from the head, but from the heart, spirit, right? 
Lord, I confess my sins to you. I ask for your cleansing, for your, your, your Holy Spirit to, to take me and cleanse me and use me and make me one of your children. God will come in and he will do his work. And he will witness to you that he has received you into his fold. Okay? And you will have that assurance in registered in your spirit. We are told by the Holy Scriptures that with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. We need a strong Christian testimony, born of a strong Christian experience. Things of the world or personal ambition should not be permitted to crowd out the still small voice of God as he commands his forces. The object in giving this lesson is to strengthen the Christian forces on earth and to encourage each individual soldier of the cross. So we want to encourage you as a believer. Do not allow Satan to steal your joy. Because we have to remember that Satan has a job to do and he is going to do his job. And he's doing his job. We need to know that Satan cannot do with us anything that we don't yield ourselves to him to do. We have to make the choice. We have to side with him. We have to allow him to lead us. But when we, as Christians, draw close to God, the Bible scripture said, draw nigh to God and he will draw near to us. When we get that closeness to, and close connection and position with God, we have power to resist the devil and he certainly will have to take his departure. So draw nigh unto God and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because he's going to bring doubt all the time to us to try to make us feel intimidated, to try to make us feel wobbly in our walk with God and try to bring back things that we know Christ has forgiven us of because we asked him to and he has put that behind us. But the devil wants to bring them back to, to haunt us and to disturb our peace. That's his job. So we can know that we are justified. Now let's look at scriptures. 1 John 3.14 We know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And that death there means spiritual death. Okay? You are in a spiritual death if you do not love your fellow men. Let's hear what the meditation says. Love the brethren. The gospel of the Lord Jesus removes from the human heart hatred and envy, planting in its place the fruit of love. Consequently, it will become natural for a Christian to be interested in the welfare of his brother. And he will manifest a genuine concern and devotion toward him. Not a make-believe, not a pretense, right? But a genuine love you will exhibit towards your brother or your sister. If there is hatred in the heart toward a child of God, it is proof then that that soul is not born of the Spirit of God but abides in death. And that's why some people who profess Christianity do not elevate in their spiritual um, endeavor or desire because 
they are not born of the Spirit. Because if you are born of the Spirit, it's going to liberate you from the bondage of sin and what is holding you back. Right? God will give you liberty and freedom from those things. And one of the first things that God gives to each child of his is the ability to love. And the things that we used to are the, like the things that we used to harbor in our hearts and the grudges, the, the, the animosity against others and so forth. God will take that away and replace love in our heart. So love is one of the, one of the first ingredient that God is going to give you in the chain of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? Now, verse 21 says, Beloved, if your heart condemn, beloved, if your heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Your heart is where the soul and the peace and the 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 the, 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 the control of what happens that spiritual being of yours is in the conscience and we call it the heart, right? But it's the conscience that will if it does not condemn us. We have confidence towards God, right? And that confidence only come when we ask God to cleanse us and to make us a child of his. And when he does so, he seals that with the assurance of his love and he gives you that seed of love that you will now start to understand what true love is about, right? So, beloved, if your heart condemn you not, then you have confidence towards God. If in your soul we have no con consciousness of transgression, having made all our wrongs right and departed from sin, we are then free from our condemnation. And by this we have the knowledge that we are born of God. Since we cannot see God or hear his voice with our natural ears, it is by faith that we attain freedom in him. Faith, right? If we doubt, we lose the joy of our salvation. Our salvation is by the walk of faith, trusting in God, believing that he has done what he has promised to do on our behalf or in our behalf and we walk by faith now first john 5 9 um says if we receive and i'll read down to verse 10 also if we receive the witness of man the witness of god is greater for this is the witness of god which he had testified of his son he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. So, Scripture tells us that no man can come unto the Father unless no, no man can come through to Christ unless God draws him, right? God's Holy Spirit will bring us and introduce us to his son, Jesus Christ. And we need to accept that Christ came to take away our sins. He came as this sacrifice for humanity's sin once and for all. So we don't have to go back and into those ceremonial sacrifices and shedding of blood of pigeon, rams and goats, etc. Christ became that sacrifice. And we need to, to accept this gift that Christ 
that God has given through Christ to us for our redemption. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he had testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record God gave of his Son. So salvation comes only through the Son of God. Um, the meditation on these verses says, It is a serious error not to believe that the witness that God has given of our salvation. Of course, it is the devil's business to get us to doubt, if he can. He will believe, we will believe the witness of men. Then why not believe the witness? that God has given. Of course, we are not to say that a man has the witness of the indwelling presence of Christ just because he believes in his head that God has sent Jesus into the world. No, like I said earlier, our salvation is not based upon knowing about God and knowing about his Son. Yes, it's good to have that head knowledge, but is the when we accept him, Jesus Christ, by faith to cleanse us from our sins and we walk by faith and live by faith in this life, okay? So then we receive the witness of God's Son into our lives. Um, we must believe in our hearts and to believe in our heart does effect a change where in our lives and he who is a new creature in Christ Jesus does have the witness within because his spirit bear it witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God at times it may seem as if Christ is not there but that may not be a sign at all. No one would doubt that he was married just because he could not at the moment see or reach out and touch his companion. You see, that's a simple analogy there, okay? No doubt God is to make him a liar. No doubt God is to make him a liar of this we must be very careful so we don't want to believe sometimes well, let me <clears throat> backtrack here a little bit sometimes in our experience our lives might become so crowded with work with the, the, the affairs of life that we might feel drained we might feel distance for from our our, our spiritual connection. But we need to pay attention, very careful attention to that. It's like we are having a slow leak in the tire of our vehicle. If we don't be attentive to it and we just keep ignoring it, well, you know, this will take me to work and back. You get to work and you come back and you still have a little hardness in your tire and you think it will happen again tomorrow eventually you know what's going to happen if you don't take heed onto that situation you're going to have a flat tire okay so if we when we feel that we are moving away from the presence of God we need to stop and get ourselves back where we make that connection. It's like I always say, it's like in our technical world today with our, our phones or laptop or whatever we connect to the Wi-Fi. If we are not in range of it, we're going to lose connection and we cannot do anything with our devices. So learn from that. It is the same thing spiritually. If we are drifting away from God, we are not going to feel the same 
as we are when we are close to him. It's just like a relationship too. Yes, when our partner is not around us, and especially if they take a trip or something like that, we feel the absence of that person. We know they still love us and whatever, but it's nothing like when they are close to us, okay? We can feel that direct connection. So we need to remember that we need to keep connected with God, okay? Um, Galatians 4, 6. We're speaking of knowing we are justified. That's the subject of our lesson. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because we are sons of God, because, sorry, and because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So, isn't that beautiful? Christ adopts us into his family. He now receives us as one of his by the cleansing of our sins through his son, Jesus Christ. And he now make us an heir with Christ. So, what Christ is entitled to, we now can also be entitled to the same privileges. That's what the love of God does for us. That's how deep his love is for each one of us. That he will make us heir with Christ. Give us the same privileges and rights that Christ has. Okay? That's what salvation does for us. That's real justification. That's what the love of God does for us. Okay? I must move on. Acts 16.23 says, <coughs> Sorry. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, char charging the jailer to keep them safely. This is an account of Paul and Silas. And I'll read all these scriptures uh, because I won't have time to comment, comment, comment on them. Um, who, having received a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. And at midnight... Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. You see, this is what God does. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. What a miracle. You see what God will do for his trusting people? Paul and Silas was put in prison for the gospel, for preaching the gospel. And God came on the scene as they prayed and they sang unto him. God shook the prison and made everyone that was in that prison, not only Paul and Silas, it says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, A-L-L, -L, all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. So every prisoner was free from their bonds. And listen now, verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awake out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. You see the responsibility of that um, keeper of the prison. He was the lives of those prisoners were entrusted in his care. And whatever went down wrong with any of those prisoners, he was responsible for that. So that's why he was going to kill himself. Because he found a situation where 
the prison doors were, were open and he thought all of the prisoners had escaped. But listen, verse 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice. You can imagine Paul. Hey, no, don't do it. We're all here, okay? Saying, no, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And when he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. You see, there was a difference here. There were two men in that prison that were saved. They were justified. Okay? We're talking about knowing we're justified. They had the real thing. And God vindicated their situation. God even extended that vindication to the other prisoners that they were loose to. But God was in control and he didn't give anybody the thought of running away. They were all still there in the confines of the prison. Paul declared to the prisoner, the, the um, keeper of the prison, do yourself no harm because we are all here. He was so convicted by the Holy Spirit that he asked for a light and he came trembling and he fell down before Paul and Silas, right? He didn't go and try to secure the rest of the prisoners. He came directly to Paul and Silas because he realized that God was working for them and on their behalf. And they brought them out, verse 30, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So he realized his sinfulness and he asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And not only you, but your whole house also can be saved. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. This is Paul and Silas spake unto the prisoner, the prison keep, the keeper of the prison, and to all that were in his house. So they had a meeting with the prisoner and all of his, I mean, the keeper of the prison and all of his household. And listen, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So you see what the power of God does to one who is justified. Through the instrumentality of Paul and Silas being justified in that prison, aroused the prisoner, the, prison, the, the keeper of the prison, to become also a justified person. Why? Because he recognized that God was on the scene. He recognized that there was something different between in Paul and Silas. And he cried out and said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas declared unto him the word of God. And the spirit convicted him and he was saved. He was born again, as it were. He confessed his sins before God and he also that same night was baptized he and his own and his whole house so we can know that we are saved because the spirit of god bears witness with our spirit and when our spirit 
bears witness with God's spirit, others is going to see the result of our relationship with God. And that's what happened here with Paul and Silas. The relationship that they had with God was manifested in that prison to the prisoner, the prisoners that were there, and to the keeper of the prison. Okay? And I, there might be no doubt some of those other prisoners got saved too. Okay? So we can know that we are justified. And the conclusion of our lesson says, this lesson declares the fact that very plainly that we can know that we are saved and also the knowledge of it makes the Christian testimony much more effective. The great Apostle Paul gave evidence of this by the faithfulness in the adver an adversary he met. If we are true when the hard places come along, we can expect a great lift from the Lord in the increase of his kingdom. If we let down when the trial comes, we cannot be trusted in the heat of the battle and will fail to win any victories. By staying true and exhibiting a victorious spirit after he was beaten, Paul was able to see the jailer saved with all his household. This was the atmosphere in which the early church made its growth. We must have the same spirit if we are to produce a victorious church. So in the midst of our conflicts, our crisis, our persecution, we need to remain faithful to God. And if we remain faithful to God, he is going to vindicate our cause and he's going to let his spirit work through us to others will see that we are different, we are justified. May God bless you as you endeavor to live for him. Stay close to him, be connected, have the power of God in us so that our lives can be victorious as we journey. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for the time of this lesson. Thank you for those who are watching. We pray, dear Lord, that you will encourage their hearts today, dear Lord, not to allow the devil to steal their joy, but that they will get closer to you, dear Lord, that they will find themselves empowered by a closer walk with you, that the devil, dear Lord, will be able to put to flight when we stand our ground and we declare your your victories in our lives and we rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. So we pray, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit will cover us today, dear Lord, and give us a victorious life in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support and have a victorious week. Amen.